uh, whether I wanted to actually do some real examples with the weak law of large numbers uh, or just move straight to the central limit theorem. And I, and I kind of opted to go through a, an example carefully. Um, so that's what I did. I don't know if you had a chance to watch that little like 30 minute lecture or something. Um, that's just, just kind of a nice application. It's not even really, I mean, technically it's the weak law of large numbers, but um, it's, it's kind of like the, the more statistical version of it. And what I mean by statistical version is I actually used the Chebyshev inequality to actually bound that probability, right? I mean, all, all the weak law of large numbers says is that, you know, that probability will go to zero, yeah? but it doesn't give any kind of specificity in terms of like how big n has to be to make it have, you know, below something. So to kind of estimate those uh, probabilities, you really do have to resort to going back to Chebyshev's inequality to pull that off. So um, that's kind of what I was doing. Turns out that n being bigger than 250,000, which is what I had in that case, in that case for the coin flip problem, that's, that's kind of like an out of control lower bound. Um, that's that it, n does not have to be that large for uh, to guarantee that the proportion of heads within a hundredth of, of its mean one half. Um, it turns out there's much better bounds. In fact, I'm kind of thinking about maybe talking about uh, some bounds that I've found to be very very helpful. Um, that aren't covered in the book. There's some called the Chernoff bounds, which use exponentials. And, and really, that's the thing that, uh, that seems to be most helpful in practice. Because a lot of times it's not good enough to like have basically something going to zero as one over n, which is essentially like what we had in this case. It was like a constant over n, that probability going to zero that fast. The Chernoff bounds use exponential functions uh, and kind of the Chebyshev Markov idea to get better bounds. And, and there you can get some really helpful uh, bounds that just destroy the, the ones that, we, that I was going through in this particular lecture. I mean, and bigger than or equal to 250,000, it's, that's ridiculous. I mean, you, you'll, you'll be not just within a hundredth, you'll actually be within like maybe one ten thousandth with probability um, bigger than 90, 99% or something. But you may notice a theme, Markov, Chebyshev, Chernoff, all of those sound Russian and they are. Um, Russians are, were kind of the trailblazers when it came to these probabilistic bounds and using them and um, kind of to analyze algorithms, uh, randomized algorithms, and uh, they, they really were uh, kind of the ones that, that took all of the old probability stuff and started using it in practical ways, statistical applications and whatnot. So I'll talk about the central limit theorem on Monday, but I'm, I'm also thinking about briefly showing you the Chernoff bounds. Um, by the way, I mean, uh, I mentioned that the, the Chebyshev inequality, um, you know, I gave the version that involved the variance, but also you can actually raise X minus the, the mean to any even power, even power. And, and get a similar thing that sometimes is more helpful. I didn't explain it in the lecture, but why do you think it, I, I just wanna see what you guys would say if I asked this. Why do you think I said it had to be even? What do you guys think? So why couldn't I do like x minus mu raised to the third power, for instance? Why wouldn't the same proof necessarily go through? Is it so that it will still be a positive number? Yes. That's exactly right. 
So that uh, raising to an even power guarantees that that X minus the mean raised to the M, that that will be a positive random variable. And that was critical to apply the Markov inequality and get the Chebyshev inequality from it, yeah? Uh, it doesn't work if, <laughs> if that thing is potentially negative. Um, so that's why you have to restrict your attention to only even powers. So, yeah. Um, and sometimes those are called, like the variance is called the second central moment. That's what the variance is. Basically, you're subtracting the mean from the random variable and raising it to the second power. That's called the second central moment. And so the Chebyshev inequality is basically saying, you know, the probability that X minus the mean is bigger than or equal to K is no more than the mth central moment for M even divided by K to the M, okay? Uh, that's the thing I have in my mind all the time when I think about um, extended versions of the Chebyshev inequality. Um, but those two, th those two uh, are the Chebyshev inequality, man, I can't tell you how many times I've run into like a research problem and I'm like, man, I, I need to bound this probability. What do I do? And then I forget about the Chebyshev inequality for like four days. And then I'm like, oh my goodness, all I had to do was use the Chebyshev inequality and this thing just goes away immediately. So um, don't forget about that. It's a really, really helpful thing. All right, what questions do you have? Any questions? So you mentioned a quiz next week. Yeah, I'll just give a, I'll just pick a problem probably from like chapter eight and have you work on okay. it. Okay. That was my question. If it was going to be from chapter eight or. Yeah. Okay. Um, so miraculously, we ended up getting through everything. Um, I don't know how that happened. Uh, I wasn't even like paying attention to the schedule at some point because I was like, well, this is all out the window. And then just like last week, I realized, oh man, I, we've caught up and um, we're even kind of past some of the stuff. And I think part of it was that I had been doing chapter seven kind of intermittently throughout the whole semester. So that's kind of what happened. So we're able to breeze through that a little bit quicker. So you guys got the full treatment there, so that's good. Um, but yeah, I'll pick a problem from chapter eight for you to work on. Okay, and will that come out early next week? Yes. That, like... yeah, yeah. I'll send okay. it on Monday, and it'll okay. probably say it's just due Wednesday or something. Okay. S something to do. What else are you gonna be doing with your time? Right. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, what else? Other questions? Anything else? Did you guys look at the thing that's uh, due today? Did, did my hint kind of make sense? Or did you just ignore it and do whatever you, uh, said I was confusing. Um, hopefully I made like what at least one of the marginals. I don't know if you noticed, but if you try to compute one of the marginals, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't do it. Right. <laughs> so, um, I just wanted you to not panic when that happened. It doesn't really matter. You can express the marginal as an integral, right? That happens in applications all the time with differential equations. Um, you end up with a solution. You're like, oh man, I don't know how to do this integral. Well, I'm just gonna leave it as an integral and your answer will, will literally have an integral in it. So I think, I forget which marginal it was. Maybe it was Y or something. That ended up actually being <laughs> an integral with Y in one of the limits, yeah, or something. Um, so, so yeah, hopefully that didn't panic you at all, but 
I just didn't, I didn't want you to be like, oh man, what is happening? I can't do this integral. And it's like, you're right. You can't. There's no antiderivative for that. So. Um, and if you try to do integration by parts, you'll just look like a buffoon after uh, application after application just makes it worse and worse and worse. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what else? Anything else? Dr. Hammett, mm -hmm. um, for the last, like, some project slash exam that we did, yep. so we don't have to do the final because of the bonus, but um, is that going to be a grade for us yeah. eventually? Okay. Yeah, well, um, I mean, my thinking was if I would have given you that bonus problem without giving you any of the other stuff, if I would have just said here, do that problem. Um, that would have probably taken you longer than any final uh, I could have possibly written. But the way that, we, that I kind of led you through it on ex exam, th on the third project, if you will, or exam three, made it so that it was more manageable. But at least that one problem itself and everything I asked you to do with it to me that it was like, well, that's, that's just as hard as anything I could have given you on a final. So, and, and I think probably in some ways, probably more helpful just because it forced you to, it forced you to really see what was happening in general. So yeah, I'm, I'm just going to count it as a grade. Um, like I would have for the, for the final. Yeah. I wasn't sure if people would take me up on that, but you guys, you guys impressed me. So, you know, I thought about having you do both four and five, but then, you know, I did the five one and it was like, you know what, this is no longer fun. Uh, the fourth one was still pretty fun because it was like, you could see it and you're like, oh man, I see what's happening here. And one reason I wanted you to see that example is you can clearly see the sum of these things moving toward a what looks like a normal distribution, right? Very quickly. And that's the essence of the central limit theorem. You start with any crazy distribution, you know, where you have, you know, several independent random variables of that distribution and you add them together, you're going to get, uh, you're going to, that sum is going to tend toward a normal distribution very quick. Um, even for pretty obnoxious distributions. So that's what the central limit theorem basically says. And I wanted you to kind of see that in practice, at least with the uniforms. Um, in, in some sense, the uniforms are the hardest. The exponentials, uh, that it's pretty easy to see what's going on with those. Um, and some other ones, it's fairly easy to see what's happening. Binomial even, binomial, it's pretty easy to see what the sum of those things, what the distribution is, and then you immediately start seeing, oh, this is tending toward a normal curve. But the uniforms, for whatever reason, it's just a little bit trickier to work through. All right, what else? Other questions? How many of you are in research methods right now? Oh, wow. Amazing. So, Emma, did you turn your paper in? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the only missing link. Oh, that'd be, I'd be, I'd be interested to read that. Yeah. Roper about it, but he hasn't sent it to me. So maybe if, if you think about it, you could <laughs> send it. What did you, what else, what did you guys do? Matthew, what'd you do yours on? Mine was Zermelo Frankel. Oh, okay. What about what about you, Katie? I did an overview of risk theory. Risk theory. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, there's this huge belief, at least among the Society of Actuaries and like the actuarial discipline, that something like a CEO and even like a CFO, chief financial officer, that those two positions 
eventually will kind of be combined into one, which will be like a chief risk officer, someone who has more of a broad overview of, of risk, be it financial risk, health risk, and they could even oversee things like the human resource side of things, also financial investments for a firm. Um, they think that's going to happen. They think that they're going to take over the world with their, with their uh, risk uh, prowess, I guess. But I mean, I, it does seem fairly reasonable, especially in days when people are trying to save a buck, right? They want to hire two people. They want to hire one person. But, yeah. What did you do, Elise? Mine was on the Colats conjecture. Oh man, are you serious? Did you it was a lot of fun. <laughs> like, uh, no. <laughs> Became a little bit obsessed with it for a time, but yeah. Yeah, it'll like, happen. I've gotten a lot of crazy emails about that. <laughs> people know, know that I work with probability and combinatorics, so I'll get these emails from people that think they've solved it. I, this has happened multiple times. One time, there was a guy in Montana, I should show you what he said. I mean, he had just done a boatload of work and it was so convoluted that I couldn't immediately just say to him, uh, this doesn't work. And I had, to, I had to kind of read through it. And then I was like, oh man, he really does have some interesting stuff I haven't seen before. So I thought about it for like a year um, just off and on and we kind of corresponded back and forth and he was actually dying of cancer um, and then one day I realized oh all he's done is like reformulate the Colatz conjecture in terms of binary sequences so and I had to write him this email and say hey, hey man I'm sorry this thing is is not any different than the actual Colatz conjecture itself. And it's just, it's going to be just as hard to, <laughs> to solve it. Why don't you do, tell, did you, do people know what the Colatz conjecture is in here? Yeah. So, because of Elise, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. So if you start with an even number, divide it by two. And then if you come, if you come to an odd number, uh, multiply by three and add one. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Multiply by three and add one. And if you keep doing that, the conjecture is eventually you'll always end up at one. There's no known counterexample to it, but no one can prove it. So it's kind of an, it's sometimes it's called the three n plus one conjecture also. But yeah. Well, cool. Glad you guys are enjoying that. Any other questions? All right. Well, I'll let you guys get back to it. Thanks, Dr. Hammett. Yep. See ya.